Well, good afternoon. Thursday, October 12, 2017. Welcome back to the Seth and Chris Show. As promised, we are going to give you Seth and Chris. Um, <laughs> I'm Seth, of course, Seth Leibson. And Chris Llewellyn is uh, the vice president here of All Things Important, as you know, and he is sitting in pro tem as my producer today, which is a great thing. Uh, for those of you that don't know, which I imagine is about 99.9% of you, Llewellyn and I are very good friends. But um, we, wouldn't it be fair to say, Chris, haven't been seeing each other much lately. It's just been a really been busy distant. week. It, very, it's we've been distant. Yes, been distant ever since uh, you got all big and popular on stage. No, seen no, so much no, no. No, it's just been busy, and you know we have the kind of friendship theoretically. I thought that you could just pick up where you left off after chasms of time, like all great friendships have. That's true. And so the powers that be thought, well, why don't we just resume our friendship with you producing the show today, so we can talk about all the normal things you and I usually do. In your office when we're visiting. <laughs> <Can> we <laughs> Not exactly, that? huh? I am glad to hear you say that. At least it wasn't like, uh, listen, it's uh, it's it's me, it's not you. That type of conversation <laughs> since we've been uh, so distant. But yes, we can <laughs> we can have conversations on this radio, maybe not the same in the office. And if anyone wants to join in that conversation, the phone number is 602-508-0960. We've got a lot to do today. We've got... Uh, guest from the Heritage Foundation joining us at the bottom of the hour on the tax reforms. Got Robert Graham, one of my favorite people who talks on the economy, coming in for the third hour. And Brandon Weicker, one of the great foreign policy minds of the country, joining us in the second hour because we're going to do a bit of culture and a bit of policy today as we try to uh, always do with um, the effort as best as we can muster to make this as nearly a Harvey Weinstein free zone as possible. Delighted to bring back one of my favorite foreign policy analysts, Brandon J. Weicker. He is a contributing editor to American Greatness, a former Republican congressional staffer. He runs the Weikert Report, which you can check out, theweikertreport.com, easily enough. It's spelled W-E-I-C-H-E-R-T. He is a member, an associate member of the New College Oxford University. Brandon, welcome back to the Airwaves of Phoenix. Thank you so much for having me, Seth, and uh, it's nice to finally be able to connect with you. Sorry about the phone tag we've been playing the last couple of months. Quite all right. You're worth the wait. I oh, appreciate it. Very, very, very kind. <laughs> so, so, so don't let me down. No. <laughs> the stakes are very high now. We've raised right, those. Right. We've raised those stakes. Is, are, are you in? Do you live in D.C. By the way? I, yeah, we live in Alexandria, which the, is right outside. Does of that D.C. restaurant still exist? Raise the stakes. Raise Steakhouse. I don't think. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, think it does actually. either. It was a great place. Think. Raise the yeah. stakes. Uh, I was just at a uh, French bistro meeting uh, the managing editor for American Greatness. Uh, oh, were you? Yes, Ben. And so that's why actually we weren't. I wasn't able to respond to your email because I didn't have a uh, uh, accent. My Wi-Fi wasn't working. But that's. Uh, Small world. He came out here, and so we're uh, we're talking about getting a podcast going. E e for... Either it's a small world, or he's in trouble for abandoning ship and <laughs> going on these trips to Washington D.C. unauthorized. No, <laughs> one of the two. <laughs> eating well, we at French talking... bistros. What the, well, we were, what the, we were talking <laughs> about well, it's a little coffee shop. We're eating at the about... French bistros on Gucci Gulch. Okay, all right. <laughs> All right, I think you you might have just gotten a demerit for him. Good work, Brandon. All in thirty seconds. Well, no, we we were talking about um, about a foreign policy podcast oh, that good. I think would be very fun for American greatness to do. And you know, it would be, and um, it, it's a really good idea. Um, for this reason, we seem to be distracted by a lot lately, and some of it is right, and some of it is too prolonged. I'm trying to make today's show a basically harvey weinstein free experience i appreciate that yeah you bet <laughs> but the world I, I, is <laughs> i can't stand it i, I don't even care <laughs> <laughs> it was worth and it said a few things about the culture for a few days i think we've might have yeah. just jumped the shark on it though well, i think what it points to very quickly is sure. the fact that there's obviously more yes. going on in hollywood than i have some family that work out there and I'm sure that there is a, a lot more behind the scenes going on not just with weinstein uh, but, but don't you know, think the media too? I mean, um, oh, yeah. NBC all, you know, spiking the story and that sort of thing. The NBC, New York Times covering up the story. I mean, yeah, yeah. There's that, and then also it's great press. You know, sex sells. Yeah, you know, it's, it's you know, it's it's pathetic. And so I, you know, meanwhile I'm sitting here and uh, to transition into foreign policy. I've been uh, I, I've 
I've been analyzing what's going on with Saudi Arabia and Russia yep. and what, what China's doing right now. Yep. And uh, I wrote an article for American Greatness recently about how we should, you know, basically don't freak out over this new Russian-Saudi Arabia deal. Yeah, I wanted what to I, start there with you if you what want. What I should have said, though, was yet, because yes. um, when, you, uh, when, you, am I, when you account for what China's doing also, these combination of things could, I mean, as I said in the article, they will, they will complicate America's foreign policy, but we can still tweak things to work in our favor. But uh, with China now attempting to put pressure on Saudi Arabia to basically start to switch from the petrodollar to a petro yuan, which is the yuan is the Chinese currency, um, this 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 is pretty much we're witnessing the end of American, like the full on end of American hegemony, at least in the economic realm. And now I was predicting this in '09, you know, when I was you know this is years ago when I was undergraduate and. Uh, I was telling people thought I was had three heads on my you know walking around three heads. I was saying that this is when you when you have a country like the United States that has a debt that's you know going up and up and up at some point, and then you had loose monetary policy for all the years of the Obama administration. At some point, you're going to have you're going to hit a brick wall, especially when you have the United States starting to create its own natural gas and you know oil and resources and starting to look at investing in the alternative energy sources that are removing the demand or rather removing the need for Saudi oil. Saudi Arabia is going to have to pivot and go to the east and that's what they're doing. Right. So they are aligning a little bit more closely with uh, Russia right now and uh, as your article points out it, it it's an odd thing given where you know okay they have an economic interest in there obviously both countries do odd thing given uh given the military interests or the foreign policy interests at which they seem to be cross purposes whether it has to do with Syria whether it has to do with other countries Iran to be sure right well it it, it well it does you see it's interesting because um ever since Donald Trump took over as you know I supported this move on on the Trump administration's part to basically say hey look we're not going to try to regime change in Syria right. uh that was the big push that Saudi Arabia was doing Mm-hmm. And they wanted to get rid of Assad, and for a period of time, Turkey did as well until they cut a deal with the Russians. Um, and so Saudi Arabia is taking a page from Turkey's book and making a deal with the Russians, I think, because they don't want to get cut out of the, uh, you know, a potential partnership with such a, a fellow large oil and natural gas producer like Russia. Um, it's it's strange, but it's not it's not unwarranted given what's going on in the region. After eight years of the Obama administration, where Saudis don't know if they can rely on us, uh, you've been, before that you had the eight years, to be fair, of the George W. Bush administration, where we basically went in and destabilized the whole region. Um, and so the Saudis are looking for stability. And uh, Russia, you know, being the, the friend of autocrats that around the world, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin is, is a stable person in their eyes to, to rely on. There is a bonus, though, here in that we now have, because Saudi Arabia is going to become more important if this thing keeps going, they'll become more important to Russia over time than I think Iran will. And that means that we, because Saudi Arabia doesn't want to cut us out entirely, uh, that means we have some abilities, I think, to put pressure on the Saudis, who also want to put pressure on the Russians to keep Iran at bay. So this actually could, I think, if we play our cards right, work to our favor. That's that's an interesting and, and good way to look at it. I want to come back to that in a second. Sure. I want I want to pause for a moment, though, or, or, or ask you to expand a little bit on something that um, initially worries me tremendously, and that was what your sentence that this marks a part of the end of the American he- he- hegemony in the region. Uh, yeah. This should make us nervous, should it not? I would rather, that, that if there's going to be yeah. a hegemon, I'd rather it be us than someone else. I agree, and what makes me worried, what I didn't include in the article is I didn't even think about it, and that's my bad. Actually, David Goldman over at um, Asia Times Online wrote me a little thing on Facebook, and he sent me some interesting charts that he's been working with, is that I didn't even think to to incorporate the Chinese maneuvers that are going on and when you factor the chinese into how the you know the russian saudi alliance is playing out that is an interesting thing because china's basically they're selling off all of our debt that they own they're getting rid of all that um their economy has stabilized they've gone they're they're still a major growing economy now uh all that talk last year uh, of the end of china was completely overstated as we found out and now they're, it seems, 
putting pressure on the Saudis to start getting rid of the petrodollar uh, and getting re- and moving over to a petro yuan. And if you remember, the th- I mean, Trump talked about this in the campaign. It's been going on for years, though. China has not been floating their currency in order to keep it at a low rate. And so it's, 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 it really hurts the dollar at a time when, you know, look at the last, this is look at the last eight years, a time when the dollar has been really taking, taking a hit long term. And we've been devaluing with, you know, printing of money and all of that. And so it's, um, you know, it could be a long term negative trend. But again, we have a lot of bad things happening to America over the last two decades in terms of economic decline. And you have the rise of the multipolar world, the world of many powers, not just one. This is going to happen. This was bound to happen at some point. It's unfortunate it's happening now. Uh, I think that if the Trump administration is paying attention, they can slow it down um, and make the changes they need to make to keep us as a hegemon. But it seems to be that we're kind of on autopilot right now in this regard. And it it looks like that China is really rising. Brandon, um, we're going to go to a break in a moment. You're usually good for a while. You can stick around. Yeah, I'm here for a while. Yeah, good. You need me. It, it takes a while to get you, but when we get you, we got you. <laughs> and we're like the Hotel California. You can check in, but you can That's never leave. Rock stuff. Yeah, awesome. it's okay. It's all right. It's, uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm with uh, Big Lebowski, you know, the Eagles. When he sits there, he goes, oh, I hate the Eagles. <laughs> Hang up on him, Llewellyn. Get, throw him out of the cab. Throw him out of the cab. This cannot go on. You hate the Eagles? No, I was joking. It's the only saying... thing the dude got wrong. I was... I was just. Oh my goodness! I don't hate Brandon. the Eagles. No, I was just saying. All right. All I right, was saying it reminds right, me of the, right. the show. Oh, it reminds you. Of yeah. It. I'm oh, sorry. Put you in mind of a. Ne- okay, so it was a negative index. I get you. <laughs> We're talking to Brandon Weikert, all issues foreign policy. I want to come back on the China thing, particularly uh, what our leverage can be with China, uh, given the debt situation, and in fact, what you said also being true that they are starting to sell off some of our debt. And I want to come back to some other places, too, that we aren't talk about, haven't talked about. You think about all that has been left on this administration's lap from the previous administration. Yeah. It's a lot. We'll be right back with Brandon J. Weikert. I'm Seth Liebson. You have a question? He's happy to take those, too. Welcome back to the Seth and Chris Show. I am Seth Liebson. We are delighted to be joined by foreign policy guru Brandon J. Weikert, contributing editor at American Greatness editor and publisher of the Weikert Report, and a man of parts. So while we're doing foreign policy, um, I kind of stepped into some trouble, I think, in the last hour, Brandon, by proclaiming um, and declaiming on on pop music and rock music. And I think I might have said something not as good about the Beatles as someone wanted me to. You being a man of parts, you're you're, you're willing to entertain calls on music as well as foreign policy, are you? Okay, in that case, we must go to Bob in Phoenix, who wanted to weigh in on the Beatles. Bob, you're on the show with Seth and Brandon. Hi, Bob. Hey, hi, how you guys doing? Hey, doing uh, Seth, I'm going to do a prelude to uh, this long list I have for you. Oh, good gosh. Uh, please run for Kristen. <laughs> okay, house. thank you. I can't talk about that on radio, but go on. to Make your musical point, brother. <laughs> okay, oh, I'm not the Lone Ranger. I'm thinking that. Okay. Okay, the Beatles song yesterday Yeah. was probably... And I don't have exact figures. I tried to locate them somehow of the actual money involved yeah. in that. And they were on the charts forever. Yeah. But just just by recordings alone, every venue you can imagine, R&B, rock and roll, opera, jazz, blues, folk, classical, movie scores, symphonies, elevator music, commercials and radio and TV. All countries and languages, church, <laughs> church services, okay. funerals, All right. Broadway, All right. Okay. high school, college, concerts, football, sports, uh-huh. etc., have utilized that song. Okay. Believe me, All it, right. it, there's nothing close to it. So what was, your, by the way, what was your uh, preference? Southern, oh, yeah, Cro- Southern Cross by Crosby, Stills, and Nass. Brandon, where are you on this? Uh, I got to say, I'm, I'm a fan of The Who, if we're talking classic rock. Okay. So I, I would say, uh, who are you, or won't get fooled again, or uh, <laughs> behind blue eyes, any of those are, are, are Pen, pretty good. Pinball fantastic. wizard, we do a little yeah, of that here. Yeah, that's right, that's right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Bob, thank you. As you can see, Brandon can weigh in, and you can see that what the American people care about here, <laughs> Brandon. Um, well, I'm sure entertain some more on this. I have an email i got to read you in a moment, but let me get back to foreign policy for sure. just a moment. 
you had mentioned China's beginning to sell off some of our debt. One of the concerns we in America have had for decades now is what our leverage can be yeah. with China because they own so much of our debt. What What is the answer to that? Uh, it, it, go ahead. You know, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and there, there's nothing really I can think because of the way the market works. Right. Um, up front, and uh, by the way, the thing about the what's what this, how this works is they're not doing this all at once. Right. This is so during the commercial break, I just did a quick cursory search on Google, uh, and I found articles going back to 2007 in which China was already at that point starting to to really uh, try to keep their currency low. And then, of course, 2009 they were buying they were buying increasing levels of the U.S. you know U.S. debt. And so basically, what it looks like. If you're a conspiracy-minded person, you'd say it looks like they're really on this long-running plan to totally undermine and destabilize the dollar. Now, I think it might be a little bit less conspiratorial and more just good politics on their part. They see that we're making ourselves vulnerable, and they want to be the number one power. And so they're making moves smartly to both keep their economy rolling and to to basically undermine and destabilize their number one rival, uh, the United States. And so they're slowly doing this. But as of January of this year, the Chinese had gotten actually below, I believe they, they actually now own less debt, U.S. dollars, than um, – than Japan does. Okay. And so that means that they're really offsetting a lot of the stuff that they were buying the last eight to ten years. Um, they're, they're offloading it, rather. And so to me, and now with the pressuring they're putting on Saudi Arabia, and I think it's only going to intensify over the next couple of years, it sounds to me like they're really pushing on uh, something they had proposed in 2009 with the Russians, which was to create an alternative world reserve currency. Mm. There's a lot of these kind of they're, they're all aimed at taking out America's economic might. Um, and so, to me, there's there's really little we can do other than trying to get other countries to buy back some of our you know some of our debt. Maybe trying to get Americans to buy. I mean, there's this is very it's a very difficult thing to say because this is all. You know, it's kind of in the clouds. It's all over, over, over time, and, and so, somewhat, somewhat virgin territory as well. Yeah, yeah, and so I mean, this is a whole new form of economic warfare, and they've been waging. And I wrote a three-part series. I'm thinking of converting into an ebook on how the Chinese actually won the Cold War. Oh, you need to. Oh, you need to, because I think um, one thing that I, not one. I mean, there are other things too, but one big thing I agree with um, Sebastian Gorga and Steve Bannon on, is that we have ignored the China issue. Oh, there's no doubt. Yeah. I've, I've been saying this, so, I mean, yeah. Seb taught at the Institute of World yeah, Politics, right. where I got my master's right. from. Right, And I was saying this, I remember, I've been saying this for, you know, three, four years, but I've known him, and, and we've, we've talked about this, and this is a common thing that we hear, you know, from, from people like myself, Seb, Bannon, yeah. but it's something that is not very rare it's very rarely talked about in polite circles no people don't want to take it on and when they no, do when the journals and think Russia, tanks though. do the china pushback is amazing i know well because they brought up you know the china lobby is back it's huge and it's huge and uh you know it's 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 very it's very sad to see because they have been waging unremitting economic warfare on this and i would argue that what they're doing with the petrodollars trying to get rid of that get the saudis to trade it with the yuan and i would argue what they're doing with selling our debt in order to destabilize our currency even more, I really think this is part of a long-running uh, economic warfare strategy, and this is all part of Sun Tzu's winning, you know, sure. w- winning without fighting an actual war. There and the, yeah, so there it is. I, yeah, no, I, I mean that, that's right, and I think it raises a very serious question um, of people or two people who say we could leverage China to deal with North Korea, which I want to talk to you about yeah. in a moment, but I want to intersperse. Perhaps something that might that might bring both of these issues together. Um, you, line two, you you had a call about something about the Beatles and the Soviet Union. Yes, are you there? Yes. yes? Go yes. ahead. Go ahead. What do you got? Yes, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen or heard of it, but there's a great documentary called "How the Beatles Defeated the Soviet Union," oh, and it's about the '60s generation going up in the Soviet Union, being. Uh, blocked from being able to hear Western music. I, I'm, I'm familiar generally, we're going to a break, I'm familiar generally with the thesis, and I know Khrushchev had banned the electric guitar, but I'll 
pick up on this point. We'll go back to Russia. We'll go back to China. We'll go back to North Korea. And we'll go back to music with Brandon Weikert in just a moment. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Seth and Chris Show. I'm Seth Liebson. Delighted to be joined by Brandon Weikert as we go around the world and talk a little foreign policy, a little culture, a little music, a little fun as well. There are a few places in the country, fewer places in the country that could be the opposite of the song. Hell is a place on earth, North Korea being one of them, Brandon. And um, that's another big issue that was left on, big country, big problem that was left on Donald Trump's lap to deal with. Um, Your take on where we are right now, I was talking with someone the other day saying, you know, he'd make the bet that we're in a nuclear war in the next four years. I'm not making that bet. I don't believe that. Well, I have a very good friend who who works at the State Department, and I'm not going to say where because they'll people would figure out who he is. But he, um, we were at an event last week, and he sought me out at the gala, and he pulled me. My wife was with me. He pulled us both aside, and he said that the State Department right now is a disaster. It's a black hole. Is what he kept saying. It's uh-huh. a black hole. Right. And he said, "Thank God we have the guy. They have a skeleton crew running the North Korea desk." And he said, thank God we have the guy who we have because he's the last experienced North Korea handler we have because everyone's apparently leaving the State Department after the big budget cuts were enacted. Yeah. And there's a problem right now with the foreign policy toward North Korea in the, on the, the government side in terms of everybody but Donald Trump. Um, Donald Trump has made excellent I thought he's I think he's doing a great job with handling it I think that he's trying something new which is what we need uh, I just wrote a, a, a long assessment at my on my website the Weikert report for a friend in California uh, and basically the bottom line is I think that Trump is communicating with the North Korean leadership that he's amenable to a deal and the North Koreans are going to accept the deal Uh, But I think the problem is that Kim Jong-un is not a stable actor, and I think what Kim Jong-un is doing is he's buying time. The DIA reports that in 18 months maximum, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un will have a ICBM, intercontinental ballistic missile capability, that can reliably reach the United States, the West Coast. And so what, what I think Kim is doing is he's going to make a deal with Trump and buy time to make sure that his technicians and scientists can actually build enough of these missiles that they can put the miniaturized nuclear weapons on top and threaten the United States. And I think that Kim Jong-un, I, I'm, on the, I'm in the minority opinion on this, but I actually think Kim, Kim Jong-un wants to succeed where his father and grandfather failed, and he wants to forcibly reunite the Korean Peninsula under his his belt. So my prediction, if I, if I may, is I do think there is going to be some type of deal, uh, but that deal is going to be short term, and I don't think we realize how short term it's going to be. I think once Kim Jong Un realizes he has intercontinental ballistic missile capabilities that are reliable, things are he's going to start getting very belligerent and aggressive because he's got a lot of issues with daddy and granddaddy, and he wants to succeed where they failed and be seen as the greatest of the three Kim rulers of Korea. Well, one of the great things about talking to you is is, is every time you speak, you raise other questions. Um, and, and one of them that is concerning, there was a lot of talk last week about, you just talked a lot about what's going on at the State Department. There was a lot of talk last week, a lot written last week about Rex Tillerson and possibly his tenure uh, not looking long. Um, and Buskirk and I were talking about this, and, you know, I, I don't carry any necessary or positive or negative brief for Rex Tillerson. But one of the things that uh, Chris and I were worried about was, okay, if he goes, who do we got? You know, our foreign policy bench is is just, it used to be very strong. It's just not anymore. No, it's not. When you know, put it this way, I and several others from the institute where I, I graduated from, uh, we we all assume that new administration, we're all Republicans, we'll have a good shot with our credentials to, to get in, and particularly the State Department, and it just did not happen. And my friend who's working there told me, you don't get it, he said that we are so understaffed, we don't even have people to read the resume. Right. <laughs> and so it's like he said, we need people, and we can't get them because we don't have enough people to even sift through the human resources side. Um, and so he said normally what they do is after six weeks they just throw all the resumes out that they have and they start over. Oh, my gosh, yeah, I get it. I mean, I, I can I can see that happening. It's like, okay, yeah, it's let's, so, let's, yeah, let's get rid of the I'm, old headache and start the new series of headaches. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And I'm, I am worried, and my friend is worried, and he was – yeah, he, he's very worried, actually. And for him to be worried, 
I get a little concerned because he is, you know, he's, he's not a worrier by nature. Well, no, and he's, he has access to information that I don't. And uh-huh. so, um, you know, he, obviously he didn't tell me anything he wasn't supposed to, but in terms of, you know, he, he made it clear that there are, that he is not, he does not feel safe right now. Okay. Wow. And in terms of the national security. You got one more segment in you after this? Oh, break? yeah, as long as you need me. All right, brother. I'm We're going to do so, it because yeah. uh, we haven't talked about the big one, which I think Donald Trump is scheduled to give a talk on tomorrow, and that's a. Iran. I want to get your take on what we're doing there. And uh, also want to read you folks some emails on rock songs. Uh, Gosh, they're hilarious. This emailer says, can I read it? He says, um, I just got back and now have to coach football practice, but Southern Cross barely qualifies as a rock song. No less. The best rock song ever. Tune is soft. No driving guitar or drums. You can't crank it and press harder on the accelerator when it comes on the radio. In short, if it wouldn't abhor Alan Bloom as playing to one's animal instincts, it probably doesn't qualify. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Seth and Chris Show. I'm Seth Leaps and delighted to have with us Brandon Weikert, um, foreign policy guru, uh, uh, contributing editor at American Greatness, of course, editor and publisher of the Weikert Report. Uh, Critical uh, reading and critical learning from Brandon on the foreign policy scene. Brandon, before we get to Iran, I want to uh, give you two more emails on music that you can feel free to either ignore or not. But um, uh, one of my uh, one of my listeners' emails, his name is Glenn. He says, uh, "My song, Southern Cross, is a great song, but it's nowhere near anything like what Led Zeppelin did with Stairway oh, yeah. to Heaven or Ramble On or oh, Queen's yeah. Bohemian Rhapsody or Deep Purple, Smoke on the Water or America's Horse." <laughs> no name or Russia's spirit of the radio or Kansas's carry on wayward song. Son, <laughs> he goes on and on. Songs, by yeah, the way. They I've are. That he's, got, he's got a theme here. <laughs> yes, no, they are. And then, of course, the other the other guy was telling me um, Paradise by the Dashboard Light, Meatloaf. Some of this is in our bumper. But yeah. um, when he was making fun of me as at uh, Southern Cross barely qualifying as a rock song, I was put in mind of that scene. Did you ever see the movie with uh, Will Ferrell and the other guys? Oh, yeah. And he oh, has a Prius, and he cranks the yeah. Little River Band in a high-speed chase. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what's his name says, what are you doing? He goes, LRB, dude. LR, <laughs> LRB as if it was a thing. LRB is what he cranks to. <laughs> you, know, you know, I do think you put yourself into a corner when you said that Southern Cross was the greatest rock song yeah. ever. Okay. You know, I would have said, you know, there are really three or four stages of rock. Yeah. You know, maybe that's one of the one of the best of the of that stage. But then you have another later stage with you know the '80s group with the Rush and and uh, you know these other these other great '80s bands. And yeah, no, forget, you make a good don't point. Don't forget the Scorpions. Don't you forget make, the Scorpions. The Scorpions which we can all laugh at. Yeah, but they're they're yeah. great. Yeah, and Billy Idol, and you know. <laughs> no, I mean it does go on and on. There's Southern yeah. rock. There's bands like and they're Led all different Zeppelin. iterations. Yeah, you know, and different. Yeah, 70s rock is different. And then from of course 80s the 90s rock. with the grunge stuff, and then you uh, know. see that doesn't. That, I, to me, there was no music after 1988. I, I happen to agree. After 88, it was all over. Yeah. No, yeah. no it's good music for my produced. generation, except so. the Shania Twain album. <laughs> Except the Shania Twain album. Maybe Martina McBride. Anyway, um, our graver business frowns on the levity, as Shakespeare said. Brandon, um, the big one we haven't discussed yet, Iran. A uh, lot of talk about that, JCPOA, renewing, not renewing. Um, what do we got? So I think that, um, well, first of all, let me just say that we cannot forget, I've written about this at my website, I've written about this at American Greatness, I've dubbed it the nuclear nexus. Yeah. Uh, North Korea, Iran with Russia and China kind of providing an umbrella. Pakistan was part of that for a while with A.Q. Khan. Uh, so was Saddam's Iraq and then, of course, Venezuela. Uh, this is a nexus of rogue states and rising states that are inimical to American interests. And so what happens with North Korea is linked to what happens in Iran and vice versa. And so we have to keep this in mind going forward. I have written, I am of, I am of the opinion that regardless of what people in the administration want, this is a bad deal with Iran. It's a bad signal. Having said that, though, there, the, the issue is neither us nor the Iranians want to be seen as the ones breaking the deal. Yeah, that's and right. And so this is the, the thing. I think that Trump, I hope he will break it and just make a statement. You know, that's, we're not going to tolerate this anymore. But we better be prepared for the knock-on effects. Uh, 
I think it's going to complicate our relationship with the Europeans because all they want to do is sell stuff to Iran, regardless of the national security implications. And it's also going to put Russia and uh, China on their heels, which will probably make China especially less likely to help us out with North Korea. Um, so, you know, but unfortunately, the direct threat here is Iran. If Iran gets nukes, even if they don't use those nukes, the issue is they're going to have the, the ability to threaten. And then you're going to have a mass proliferation. Saudi Arabia is going to get their own nukes. They've got right now a minimum of 19 nukes on hold in Pakistan. They bought them in 2011, and they're sitting there because the CIA intervened and asked them not to, to, to take possession of them. With the caveat, Saudi Arabia said we won't, but if Iran does definitely get nukes and you're not inclined to stop them, we as Saudi Arabia's leadership have to defend our country. This is what we need. Yeah, okay. Right. And so I would say that, I, I do think the administration, I think, well, I know Trump wants to, to cut, to break the deal. Um, the question is when, and the real question is, will any of the advisors in the administration who are for the deal lose the battle? Because the last two times the, you know, the, the, the deal has been upheld because of the national security team wanting to buy time. There are no good options here, but if there's one theme, unfortunately, in talking to me, it's it's that there are no good options yeah. anymore for America. Yeah. And so we have to take the bitter with the better. And for, second of all, the, another key theme of mine is we are, unfortunately, living in the multipolar world. And that means that we need to start off, offshoring a lot of responsibilities for, for national self-defense to these countries that are directly threatened. You know, in Europe, we should be offloading more to Poland yep. to resist Russia, and in the Middle East, Israel, the Sunni Arab states, and even if the Turks ever get on board or not, whatever. But, you know, we need to start Japan and South Korea and Asia. We can't do the heavy lifting anymore. Look to the language of the Nixon doctrine. Right. That is kind of where we are right now, and that needs to be our mission statement, that we will not be the only ones doing the heavy lifting. Our allies have the capabilities. We've given them the weapons. We've given them the abilities. They just have to have the will. And if they don't, well, then they lose. Oh, well. I mean, we're protected by two oceans. And if we get space going, we're going to have a great space defense system soon from what the announcement last week was with the, uh, the Space Council. So, I mean, we'll be fine, ultimately. It's going to be the rest of the world that's going to have to deal with these new Chinese and Russian, Iranian and North Korean rising powers. Yeah, we, 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 I hope we'll be fine. I mean, I think the first answer to any of these problems is missile defense. I think the yes. second answer is missile defense, and the third one is missile defense. Yes. Talking to people like, yes. you know, Brian Kennedy and some of the others in that crowd. Well, I'm actually, I'm known at, at IWP. My initial work and research area was in space defense. Okay. That's what, I'm okay. coming out to Silicon Valley next month to talk to some people about uh, beefing up military defense uh, investments and developing a new way of doing uh, satellite defense that does not rely on the international community, that relies on a independent American space force. And that, that this is, and I read Brian Kennedy's stuff too, I'm a big fan of his. Uh, and I think that, you know, th this is where we need to be going because we can't, we can't operate the way we used to where America was the hegemon. We can get back to that over the next 10 years to 20 years, but it's going to take investments in new technologies and new techniques. And one of those things is space. We just we can't do the way we used to anymore. We don't have the money. We don't have the resources. Right. That's right. And what's incredible to me is when you look at what is needed for comprehensive missile defense, we only have about 20 seconds here, how yeah. little it would cost. It's really the least oh, expensive yeah. thing, and it's amazing it's to me we will. haven't done it. problems are politics. It's that's absolutely. It's yeah. about will, not ability. That's right. Brandon, I love spending time with you, man. I love it, too. Thank you. All right. We'll be in touch shortly. Please, yes. And you have a good one. All right, brother. You, too. Thanks, folks. You want to follow Brandon J. Weikert, you can do so at American Greatness, amgreatness.com, or, of course, you can go to his website, uh, his own website, The Weikert Report, which is theweikertreport.com. He spells his last name W-E-I-C-H-E-R-T. It is an amazingly dangerous, the world is an amazingly dangerous place right now, more so than many thought it would be at this point in the 20 aughts, 2017, I guess. And you know what? The problems did not start 10 months ago. They did not start 10 months ago. 602-508-0960. Weigh in on anything you like. Robert Graham coming up in the next hour. We can talk music. We can talk politics. We can talk whatever you want. 602-508-0960. Here's a little Maynard Ferguson. out a 
town on a boat going to southern islands sailing a reach before a following sea she was making for the trades on the outside and the downhill run to papa a day off the wind on this heading live the marquesas you got a Line. Nice be making way In a noisy bar in Avalon I tried to call you But on a midnight watch I realized Why twice you ran away Think about Think about how many times I've had for all in Spirits are using me Lord, your voice is calling Ship and all her 